Okay, let's do it. And I guess, Chris, while, while we're having people come on board, I can ask you a warm up question, which is in that nice stack of books behind you. Do you have a favorite one? I, of course, Scott. It's Eat, Sleep, and Innovate. <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't yeah. necessarily looking for the, uh, that wasn't supposed to be, what we say in this book, be a, a softball question. It was meant to be a real question. You must have a field paper book up there. I have lots of, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I'm, I'm the kind of person who, whose favorite book is the latest book he's read. Um, you know, because I just love um, learning. I, I, I can't say that I, I would single out any one book. I mean, th there are great books in lots of subjects. What are you, uh, what are you reading right now? So um, my um, son is um, persuading me to talk through um, Richard Rummelt's book on um, strategy, um, which I think is a fantastic um, guide. I read it some time ago, but he is trying to learn about strategy now. So we're going through it again together, actually. Diagnosis, guiding principle, and coherent set of actions. Very good. Very good. Good strategy, bad strategy. Now that is a yeah, that's it. That's it. You got a classic it. Classic on the subject. And my, my favorite part of that book, and for those of you who are joining, Chris and I are doing, I'm, I'm Scott, this is Chris. We're doing a little bit of witty banter before we actually get into the discussion at hand, which will start in maybe about 90 seconds or so. But my, the, the thing I remember from that book distinctly is the dissection of the John F. Kennedy moonshot speech and the entire moonshot program in the United States and how it wasn't just the compelling vision. It was yes. also the specific uncertainties, the specific plan, and so on, which I just think is a, a part of the story that people often miss. Well, I've used, I've, I've sort of developed a method for, for making strategy based on that book. Um, you know, he didn't necessarily um, describe a process, but I've just taken the, the, the essence of, of um, what he describes strategy is and sort of turned that into, into a method. And it stood me in, in very good stead. Because the great thing is, it starts with a diagnosis, and and so many strategies that you read or see, don't bother with that. They they leap straight to a set of assumptions, and then and then try to fix whatever they've decided in their assumptions, rather than actually studying the problem. Now, it's interesting you mentioned this, and again for the for the audience, we will get into the topic at hand now in after one more comment, which is I, I I've been doing it is as I think I, I told you I've been doing this executive master program in change that takes a psychodynamic lens on individual and institutional change as a student. And one of the big teachings is if you don't start an organizational change effort with the diagnosis of what's really going on, both above the surface and more critically in many cases beneath it, you're doomed to fail as you just have the wrong interventions. I mean, it sounds so simple, but we, we skip that step all the time, don't we? We do. And I think just to sort of close off the subject, the other thing that you need to do is make sure you're seizing opportunity as well as fixing problems. But I think quite often we also just see the problem set. We don't, we don't actually look for opportunities. All right. Well, we're going to, we're a couple minutes past the top of the hour. We're going to get started. This is being recorded. So those who are watching this asynchronously will enjoy that little banter we had at the beginning. But I'm Scott Anthony, senior partner at Innosite, the lead author of the recently released book, which I have sitting right in front of me here, Eat, Sleep, Innovate. And this is the first edition of a, our virtual book club where what we wanted to do is take some of the people who appear in, in the book, some of the protagonists of the stories, and just get them into an informal session where we can chat a little bit about their own innovation journey. I thought I would spend just 30 seconds providing a brief overview of the book, uh, then introduce Chris, and then we would get into the discussion here. If you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to type it into the Q&A button that you see at the bottom of the Zoom screen or in the chat window. Either of those are OK. I've got a whole list of questions. And if I get great questions from the audience, I'd love to bring them in as well. So the, the book in just a couple sentences, Eat, Sleep, Innovate, is a guide to how you create a culture of innovation, which we define as one in which the behaviors that drive innovation success come naturally. In the book, we say the fundamental challenge facing many organizations are existing routines, rituals, inertia, because innovation is doing something different. So you have to find ways to break and shape habits to encourage people to be more curious and be more collaborative and be better at experimenting and so on. And the book has a set of tools to help you do that. The key tool is the Behavior Enabler Artifact and Nudge. The acronym for that is a bean, 101 beans in the book, lots of great case studies, et cetera, brought to you by our good friends 
at Harvard Business Review Press, co-authors Natalie Payne Show, Andy Parker, both colleagues of mine, and Paul Coppin from DBS Bank. So that's a little bit overview of the book, just a, a little bit about Sir Chris Deverell. Sir Chris Deverell is a retired four-star general. I met him in 2016 when he had recently assumed the position of command of the UK Joint Forces Command, which is a, a big branch of the UK military that Chris might tell us a little bit more in just a minute. But Chris, I, as I was reflecting on this conversation, I went back and looked at the first email I got from your office in 2016. And I have to say the number of emails that I've gotten from four-star generals is pretty slim. So I thought maybe this is like a Nigerian bank that wanted money to be sent to. But uh, tell, tell us a little bit about the origin story. Why, why did you, why'd you contact me? Well, I'm very glad that you didn't um, you know, consider, take it as a hoax, Scott, because um, actually what you, you did was to help breathe life into what I think is a, a sort of crucial development in the UK military. Um, the reason I emailed you was I was casting around for practical ways to enable innovation in my command, which was a key component of our strategy. Um, and I'd done a lot of discovery uh, in relation to the, the diagnosis of that strategy, um, the first part of making the strategy. And I had traveled widely in the United States, East and West Coast. I'd been to uh, DIUX, as it was then called, Inkitel, DARPA, um, SOCOM and others, but I was still kind of lacking a, a, a roadmap, a detailed roadmap in my mind. In particular, I wasn't clear how I could do what I needed to do quickly and without hundreds of people, because both time and people are at a premium um, in the military, as they are in lots of places. And then in my reading, I stumbled on a Harvard Business Review article um, from, I think, 2014, which you had co-authored. Uh, which was called Build an Innovation Engine in 90 Days. Uh, and, and you had that a concept in that article called a, a Minimum Viable Innovation System that gave me permission to think in a different way. Um, it was a huge stroke of luck to find it, but I, but I shall be eternally grateful. Um, so that's why I emailed you. Outstanding. And, and you know, from, from that first discussion, a, a few years later, I, I visited this apparatus that you had set up called the, the J-Hub. So tell us a little bit more about what exactly the J-Hub was or is, and what was the journey from that conversation in 2016 to what I observed about, I guess, 16 months ago when I went to visit the J-Hub in London. Yeah, yeah. So um, J-Hub stands for Joint Hub, uh, because I was obviously the commander of Joint Forces. Um, and then it was an innovation unit, really, um, still is, um, part of, a, of, a, of an ecosystem. Um, and it was it was designed to, to work fast um, because uh, you know all my previous experience of, of defense procurement had taught me an iron law, which is that um, time equals money and risk. Um, and, so, and you know earlier in my career as a one star general, a brigadier general, I've been in a role in which I've been responsible for bringing. Um, protective equipment into service for the British Army, um, both vehicles and, and for the man. And we'd had a process then in the MOD called an urgent operational requirement, which um, enabled us to do things amazingly quickly. We, we, with the protective vehicles, we went from nothing to in service in six or seven months, which is, was fantastic. But I was horrified to see that by the time I, I reached four star sometime later, the fastest that this urgent operational requirements process was working was 18 months. That was the absolute fastest it was working. And many, many new and much needed capabilities weren't getting into the front line um, to our servicemen and women. So, it, you know, in a timely manner. So, um, you know, I wanted to move fast, obviously, to, to, to uh, deliver capability quickly because we were not doing that. I also wanted to move fast because I thought that the um, antibodies to innovation that exist in any large organization would kill the J-Hub if it didn't deliver results quickly. And I, and I kind of knew I only had three years in post and I wanted the system to be delivering clear, unarguable results by the time I left the job. So the most important part of the design of this, of this unit and indeed this ecosystem was a process which empowered the unit to move fast with, with maximum delegation and, and very abbreviated decision-making cycle. Um, 
and it really worked. You know, by the time I left the job, uh, on average, we were getting into pilot within six weeks and into con and on contract in nine months, which, you know, by the standards of MOD, I'm afraid to say it was, was warp speed. Um, but that um, process of, of enabling the organization to move fast wasn't the only bit of, of secret source for the J-Hub. And we could talk about a lot of other elements of the design of the ecosystem. Um, leadership, risk appetite, you have to think about exploitation paths, how, you know, what's the route you, someone might come to you with a great idea, but how is it actually going to actually be used? The physical location of the units, uh, attracting venture capital, close connection with users is utterly important. Um, escaping from the tyranny of the requirement, we used a process called an opportunity assessment um, rather than requirements, which, which really slow you down in, in, in defense. And also, you know, we made the unit small, young, and rank agnostic. And all of those things together, I think, uh, made it work, not, not just one part of it, but it was all designed you know, if it, from the first um, point to, to move fast. So I've got a, a, a couple observations then I wanna follow up with the, you said the word leadership, wanna follow up with the leadership point for a second. The first observation is I think this notion that there's no silver bullet is a really important thing just to reinforce. You know, in the yeah. book, we've got this tool, the bean, and it's a great enabling tool, but it's not the only thing you're gonna do if you're gonna have culture change at six and scales. You know, so like one example being is Amazon does these press releases from the future where you make sure when you're gonna launch a new product, you write a press release that says, this is what you'll write when you launch the product is from a customer first perspective. It reinforces the focus on the customer. It's a great tool to pick up. And there's a lot of other stuff you need to do if you want a culture where that kind of behavior comes naturally. That's one observation. The second, yeah. I was really struck by your comment. You said the military, like many large organizations, and I wonder actually if I could ask you to comment on this, Every organization thinks it's unique. And I think one of the great things that I've had the opportunity to observe is I've seen lots of different organizations. And to me, they're more alike in many cases than they are different. But if you go to a bank, they'll say, we have nothing to learn from the military. You go to the military, they'll say, we have nothing to learn from a fast moving consumer good company, blah, 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 blah. Does that resonate with you? Is that, is that a challenge that you face within the military? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, I think that there are greater similarities between the armed forces and say uh, a large bank than there are between the armed forces and a small startup. You know, um, the, 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 the world over, especially when it comes to innovation, if you've got a large enterprise, it is large because it has gone through a lot of change over time, it's developed and it's grown, uh, and it has a lot of inertia, a lot of processes that prevent it from adopting innovation. And those, aren't different, I think, from um, inside and outside the public sector. Broadly, they're the same. Um, obviously, what you are trying to do with something like the J-Hub is replicate much more of the behavior of a startup because there is some agility there um, and some uh, you know, urgency that, uh, and, and a risk tolerance that doesn't exist in large bureaucracies unless you do something about it. And let's talk a little bit more about it, unless you do something about it. Uh, you mentioned the word leadership as a, a key enabler of this. And I, I think no doubt that is critical, particularly in an environment that might be more on the extreme side of hierarchy. I and mean, that's just what you think of when you think of the military. So what did you feel like you had to do as a leader to create this kind of agility to enable devolved decisions and so on? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the first thing is to pick good people to lead, you know, you can't be the head of the innovation unit if you're a senior leader, you've got lots of other things to think about, but you need to make sure you pick the right person to do that. And I did. Um, it, it wasn't difficult because he was an extraordinarily talented young man um, but, and, and a great um, stroke of luck um, to find him. Um, but I, I, you know, I do think if I hadn't found him, I tried to find something like him because that leadership of the unit made a lot of difference. But then you have to give it um, the, some rope. You know, you have to delegate decision-making to it. We, we had a, a system in the J-Hub whereby decisions to go into pilot were made inside that unit. 
didn't have to be referred to anybody. They had a budget for, for pilots and you know they could just trial whatever they liked. Um, and then the, the, uh, the, the stage beyond that was once they had piloted something and they had a successful user trial with a user that was saying, we really want this thing. Then it came to a board that I chaired called the Innovation Committee which um, actually was um, most of the stakeholders at the top of the organization. They had to put a two page submission together. They came to one meeting. We made a no go decision and then it, off it went or, or it didn't, you know, if we decided not to. So we had a really abbreviated process um, that empowered the, those people doing innovation to actually get a long way down the road themselves. What you find, I think, is that if you challenge the, the existing core system too early, then it will just reject things. So you have to have done some kind of pilot, some kind of process which demonstrates uh, that this thing can really work. And at that stage, you can come to the, the core system and say, okay, um, we think this is good to go. Are you happy? So I'd love to, to pick this idea up for a little bit because you know certainly it's something that you see in other places, making it easier for people to go and give it a go, try things without having to go through the approval machinery. And I think a little bit of one of the classic beans, the Adobe Kickbox, where if you receive an Adobe Kickbox, you have lots of tips and techniques about how to run experiments and you have a prepaid debit card with a thousand US dollars on it that mm. you can spend without asking for anybody's permission, which makes it very easy for people to go and experiment. Now, if Adobe gets a software product wrong, then you know no big deal. In a military circumstance, if you screw something up in a pilot, that theoretically has some a reasonably negative consequences. It's public money, et cetera, et cetera. How do you deal with that view of risk? I, I could imagine you spent a lot of time trying to educate some of the, the politicians around you that this was a good thing to do. Yes, I mean, it, it isn't straightforward because a lot of, um, uh, a lot of criticism in in the past about departments like defense wasting public money and so if you go out and pursue something which turns out not to work you're just reinforcing a stereotype that that already exists and so politicians in particular but not just politicians are very sensitive to this issue and i i understand that but the truth is unless you take some risk you you can't um achieve what you're after so so what we did was we we started small. You know, we didn't take massive risks. We weren't trying to you know design an aircraft carrier and deliver that. Um, we were taking small amounts of risk, which in the scheme of the uh, the budget in the command was tiny money. You know, I had a budget, an annual expenditure budget of over five billion pounds. But the foot the year the first year's budget for the J Hub was twenty million. You know, just a fraction of the of the total. So. I felt that we, I could defend some risk taking with that small amount of money. And my expectation was, and indeed it's broadly been borne out, that once we had demonstrated that we were actually safe um, users of that money, people would not worry if we then started to increase the amount of money we were spending on innovation. Excellent. Well, I'm talking here to Sir Chris Deverell about his experiences as the head of Joint Force Command in the UK military. Would love if there are any questions from the audience to have them typed into the chat window or typed into the Q&A panel, and I'm happy to bring them into the discussion. I've got a bunch more questions, so I'm happy to keep going through it, but just wanted to let you know, please feel free. If you've got something you want to ask Chris, please make sure it's there, and I, I will try and pick out anything there and share it with him. So Chris, I, I want to then turn a little bit to talk about leadership. I, I want to turn a little bit to place and space. So you were mm. kind enough to allow me to go visit the J-Hub in early 2019. And I, I just remember viscerally how just obvious it was that this is something different. You know, it's a military based organization, but I felt like you're inside a any other incubator, any other startup with all the glass walls. And, and you know, you can kind of tell that people are from the military because there's a cadence that people have when they're from there. There's a clipness to their voice and everybody's got a nickname and, and all that. But, I mean, <laughs> that's the only way you really could. Other than that, I, I could have been with any organization in the world. I imagine that's not accidental. I imagine there was thought that was put into place in space. Was there? Yes. I mean, I... I don't take credit for the idea. I mean, I went to DIUX uh, initially in Boston and then in um, California, and um, I saw in, in Boston them cited on 
you know, the, the campus of Tech City in Boston. In Boston. Um, can't remember precisely where it was, but it was not on the military estate. So when, when I um, first conceived of, of setting this unit up, I said to my team, please go away and find somewhere to put it. And they came back unsurprisingly with um, some ideas that were free essentially to, to place the unit on unused part of the defense estate. Um, but these were behind the wire. Uh, so access was going to be difficult and they were remote. They were remote from suppliers um, and, and from the buzz that is the tech business. So we had to make an exceptional business case um, to spend some money on, on a serviced office space. And, and we ended up in what is known as Tech City in, in towards the east side of London in a WeWork building. And, you know, we consciously strove to replicate the look and feel of, of the startup world. We, we No uniforms, no ranks no barriers that would pre prevent suppliers coming and talking to us. And, you know, that was a, a, a key part of the design, I think. Uh, it's interesting. They, I, I, I want to pick up something you said. Being behind the wires was free. So uh, there's, yes. there's no marginal cost in doing it, but it wasn't free, was it? I mean, it came of course with not. Pretty, pretty heavy costs. Say, say a little bit more about that. Yes. I mean, so this is the tyranny of budgets, you know, um, to, to, to my um, infrastructure team, there was no cost to uh, my budget if we went and found a, a part of real estate in my command that wasn't being used. It was essentially a free good, but it was only free, even uh, you know, to to anybody in the sense that um, it di it didn't cost cash. It definitely wasn't free in the disadvantages that it had, and and principal among those are. Um, I just don't think anyone would have come anywhere near an organization where you have to go through all kinds of security processes to get into it. Um, you know, above and beyond the security that would be common in a normal office building, you know, that, that's fine. But beyond that, um, uh, I, I just felt we weren't, we were going to be stuck out in the middle of nowhere and no one would come and talk to us. And it was utterly essential in our design that the startup world, the tech startups who didn't see the, um, the the Ministry of Defense as a natural customer, were willing to come and talk to us. You know, the, the MOD uh, deals fundamentally mostly with with large prime contractors. It doesn't deal with startups, so we had to make it really, really easy for startups to talk to us. No, and you know, even the phrase "behind the wire," you're consciously trying to keep people out of military yes. installations, except for those who are supposed to be in there. So, I mean, that's a big difference. And you know, I'm just reminded as you say this, you know, the the book "Before Eat, Sleep, Innovate" is Dual Transformation by me, Clark Gilbert, and Mark Johnson. And one of the things we talk about in that book is as you're trying to drive new things in your organization, what we call transformation B, pushing in new directions, you want to be incredibly selective of the things that you borrow from your core organization. You have some mm. legitimate things that give you the ability to do things that a pure play startup could never do. But the things that appear to be free often, as you say, come with very heavy costs. So you say, well, we've got a distribution channel if you're a commercial enterprise, but that's got a business model with it that likes to distribute yesterday and not tomorrow. Or we've got an IT system. Well, that IT system might be incredible to do what you used to do, but it might really slow you down when you want to do new things. So kind of the litmus test question that I, I ask people to think about is imagine you were leaving your company. And you could take anything you want. You could steal anything you want on the way out the door to start up your new company. What would you take with you? And maybe there's an R&D scientist, or maybe there's a particular brand that you really like, or maybe there's some kind of process and system. But there's a lot of stuff that you leave behind. Nothing wrong with it. It's just built for purpose for something else. And it sounds like the same thing applies here. Yes. I mean, um, I think that's a very good way of looking at it, actually. When I started, I thought quite long and hard about this sort of classic question about innovation, where do you cite it in, in the core at the edge outside? Um, but I'm reasonably convinced that the answer is, you know, generally going to be at the edge, you know, so you, you, there are some things you, you, not least because actually, if you sit it outside, it, it's never going to get back in, you know, you, you have to do something that makes it possible at some stage that this process, that this idea can become core. Um, and that's hard to do if, if you're actually, you know, completely separate and outside the organization. But on the other hand, if you start it too close to the center, the, the, the antibodies will kill it. If you think about people whose lifelong struggle in, in, in the existing bureaucracy is to do A, B or C, and you come along 
and you get all the glory and you take away some of the money, you know, it's not at all surprising that people don't like it and try to stop it. Even if they don't do so deliberately, it, it tends to happen anyway. Um, so you've got to you've got to give it enough freedom from that from that uh, you know life sucking, um, life crushing uh, process, uh, but not make it so removed from this business that I think that that you'll never be able to scale it and bring it in to to the, to the core and the heart of the organization. I fully agree. And this is something where th those of you who are geeks about the literature will recognize that what we're saying here deviates from some of the research and writing of Insight's co-founder, the late great Harvard Business School mm -hmm. professor Clayton Christensen, who said separate organization, spin out organization. And the answer here is not quite. It, certainly, you need the space to be able to do these things. But if it's truly a separate spin out organization, you're depriving it of the oxygen that it needs to do new things. And you can never then incorporate it and change the larger organization. So, I mean, if, if our view is if you're really going to do it, just go invest in a startup. Uh, and, and that's why yes. we choose to do that. But if you're really trying to do something that fuses together unique enabling capabilities with entrepreneurialism and drive change across both sides, then you have to have that edge, we argue as well. Chris, yes, and that, that connection, Scott, to the, to the user is, is crucial. Much harder to do if you're outside the organization. If you're inside the organization, you've got to be as close to the user as possible. That's why often... You know, people think of um, research and development or, or, or science and technology as innovation, and it can sometimes be innovative, but it isn't of itself innovation unless it actually delivers something into the hands of a user. And quite often, the the the, the R and D component of organisations is too far removed from the from the user. So never they they come up with these wonderful ideas, but they never get translated into real life. So so somewhere in your design, you've got to make sure that you can really speak to the user. And in that sense, it, ha it helps if you're, for example, a military organization, if you have military people in your innovation unit because they can speak a common language and they understand each other. So I had one small follow-up question related to this, and then we've gotten a few questions that have come in, so I'll pull a couple of those in. Follow-up question, the, the, the word user, is that a normal word that people in the military would use, or is that a special purpose word that's come out of the, the journey that you followed to create the J-Hub? Um, the, there is a word, a phrase, technical term, the user in um, in the in the Ministry of Defence lexicon. Um, it, it means different things to different folks. Um, when I talk about it, I am talking about you know, the, the the end user, the, not the person who represents, not the buyer. You know, traditionally there is a big distance between a supplier and the person in the front line is going to use a, a piece of capability, and and lots of people mediate that chain um, and, and quite often you have a buying organization that sits between you um, what, what i wanted to do was move the the the, the uh, innovation unit really close up alongside the user the end user the person who was actually going to make um, use of the capability that's what i meant by the term great Great, excellent. And, and fits in with one of the themes that we have in the book. One of the key enabling behaviors of innovation success is what we call customer obsession. Innovation is something different that creates value. You can't create value unless you're solving a real problem for a real person doing a job that the person is struggling to get done. All right, so yeah, you would say customer. I mean, but, but the reason why I sort of slightly resile from that term is because it tends to, in common parlance, it assumes you pay for something. Yeah, no, no totally, the, totally the user bad. isn't necessarily paying for something, but he but he or she is using it. Well, and I think just sticking on this for a minute, and I, I will get Christian, Christian Layden is going to get the first question here. I will get that question in a second. But, you know, it is an important point, too, because, you know, people will often say, well, there's no room for me to innovate because I have no customer that I'm serving if I'm in an internal role. But there always is somebody. I mean, it could be a yeah. supplier, could be a stakeholder, could be the employee you're supporting if you're in HR, whatever, could be the user. So that there always is somebody who is downstream from you that will sure. benefit from you doing something different that creates value. All right, so Absolutely. Christian has asked this question, Layden, why do organizations become slash are risk averse? Is it because people think they'll get fired if investments don't deliver expected value? So, you know, you talked about this idea, Chris, that large organizations naturally ossify to a degree, get risk averse to a degree. Why do you think that happens in military or broader context? What do people worry about? Where, where does the risk aversion come from? So, so in the military, it is, doesn't tend to be about being fired. Nobody gets fired. You know, I mean, it's, it, it, I think it's one of the things that's wrong 
with um, the public sector is that people by and large don't get fired. The risk that people worry about is criticism. And it, it's, it's, it's your political masters reaching down and saying, what the hell do you think you were doing? You know, you, you've put us in a very difficult position. Um, and the mach whole machine is designed to try to avoid that situation. But it isn't, it, it's, it's a probrium that people fear not being fired. Uh, it's interesting. I, I've asked a question now to, I don't know, probably about 3,000 people all around the world when I'm giving talks. Just if you had one word to describe what's blocking innovation in your organization, the one word that comes up more frequently than anything else is fear. And it, mm. as you say, it's not really fear of getting fired. It might be fear of getting a wrist slap or fear of looking stupid. Yes. So what do you do about that? I, and I have to look up what the word probrium means because I've never heard that word before. A pro probrium. A pro That's even more <laughs> word. Even more <laughs> well, I'm glad I've used a word you don't know the meaning of, Scott. I regard that as a success. Um, so um, I hope it's a real word. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I, I think you have to deliver results so people get confidence that what you are doing um, actually works. I think you have to tell a story. There has to be a, you know, a coherent narrative. In that story, you've got to persuade people that there, you know, that there is a, a burning need to do something. Um, but you've also got to show how your way of doing, uh, responding to that need may actually deliver results. And, and that has to hold you for long enough until results are, are coming. And, and you can't allow that period to be very long. Otherwise people start to say, you know, you're all sound and fury signifying nothing. Um, so, so I think, I think, you know, it, consistently communicating, having a clear design, uh, and and then delivering results are, are key parts of the answer to that question. Excellent. And we also have some some tools in the book that help with this to, to create an environment that Harvard Business School professor Amy Edmondson would describe as having psychological safety, where you have mechanisms that make it it's safe for people to take well thought out risks. And I think it is a really important point to stress that this is not to encourage stupidity. This is not to encourage people taking blind risk. This is encouraging people to take very smart, very structured, very hypothesis driven risk where they simply don't know. And the only way you can answer is by doing, not by studying. Those kinds of things are very smart risks to take, but some risks are dumb and you should not encourage them. But I do think it's the case that quite often in the public sector, there are some low hanging fruit that are actually zero risk or close to zero risk. You know, the system has not been designed to find them, to seek them out and then to, then to introduce them, to use them. Um, so you start off thinking when you do this, my God, this is really frightening. I'll be, I'll be doing lots of things at the, at the edge of technology. In many cases, you're taking, you're taking capability that has been designed and is already being used for one purpose over here and either applying it to the same purpose over here or repurposing it and using it in a different way. And the risk levels are not high. You know, that's, that's the big learning for me. We're a long way. We, we are starting, I think, in the organization to do some scarier things. But for the first year, we did easy things. And that's, you know, just good entrepreneurialism. You know, it's uh, the first case that was taught in the Harvard Business School entrepreneurial management class for a long time was this case about this guy named Bob Reese, who back in the early 1980s sensed an opportunity to kind of ride the trivia game wave and put together a collection of people parlayed up, I think, $50,000 investment into a couple million dollars in return. And when people read the case, the first reaction is, well, this person didn't do anything because he didn't design the board, he didn't manage distribution, he didn't blah, blah, blah. And the key lesson is entrepreneurs don't seek out risk, is it's risky enough to do new things, they find ways to smartly manage it. And if you have people who already have the capability, and you can connect that to a new space, well, that makes your job that much easier because there's still a lot that you have to do to get it to a new place, blah, 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 yes. blah, blah. But you don't get points in this for a degree of difficulty. This is not Olympic ice skating. <laughs> this is something where you get points for delivering value to consumers, customers, users, stakeholders, whatever it is you're trying to do. Absolutely. So Chris, and then another question here, we've got about, we're gonna go until about 12.45 US time, 4.45 your time. So we've got about a dozen minutes left. Another question here that I wanted to call out Ji Yu Hang has said, I've seen situations where small risks didn't take off for over a year or two. What do you do? Because you said you want the quick wins, but what happens if you don't get them? What happens if it takes a, a couple of years to get it? Do you have to start looking at numbers instead of hope? How, how, do, how did you think about that? Yeah. 
So I think that you need to diversify. You can you can you can reduce risk by doing quite a number of things. You know, if you were trying to do just one project, one capability, uh, then that would be too risky. But if you're doing ten or fifteen or twenty things uh, in that uh, first period, then there's a, some there's a good statistical probability that some of those things are going to come good. Um, so I, I think diversification is the answer there. Um, and, and you know, even if you're trying to do one thing in the organization, you can probably break it down into smaller chunks and, and be successful in smaller chunks, even if it's hard just to do one thing. Um, so I, that's how I would, I would advocate dealing with that problem. And it's interesting, Chris, I, I connect to one of the lessons that Clark Gilbert, the co-author of Dual Transformation would always say, you know, so Clark successfully drove Dual Transformation, both in the media industry and the education industry. And one of his big points is when you're working on the new stuff, what we call Transformation B, you have to deliver results. You, you sometimes think that you have a jet, get out of jail free card and you can just go and experiment all that. And he said, there are so many forces in the organization that just want you to fail. Even if they're nice people, they want you to fail. Yes. That if you don't show that you're doing something material, you know, you, you can have it be more learning than earning if you're in a commercial enterprise or whatever, but you need something that demonstrates you're making progress. So, you know, having those small milestones that you can crush is a really important part of this, I think. Yeah, and and that involves um, I think that a thing that I think is commonplace in lots of organizations, but isn't necessarily always brilliant in large organizations, which is having a clear plan, clear milestones, and then tracking them, you know, and 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 being on top of what you're trying to do. Um, it's obvious, but it 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 helps. It's, uh, you know, simple stuff done well. This goes back to, to Richard Rumwald that we talked about in the beginning. You know, it's strategy doesn't have to be complicated, but you got to yes. do it and you have to be thorough about it. So I, we've got a question here from Arnaud Franken that looks like an interesting one. So, you know, Chris, you, you returned to civilian life in 2019. And of course, you, you can never absolutely ensure these things when you're dealing with the transition. But what did you do to maximize the chances that the change effort you started would continue after after you left? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. Um, and I think I probably didn't devote enough effort to it. And I think, um, interestingly, what's worse is that I think you told me this, Scott, when you came in 2019, you said, make sure that it isn't just about you. Make sure that i.e. that when you leave, you know, it, it will it will it will succeed. And indeed it has. But I, I, I do wish that I'd put more effort into bringing people with me. I mean, I um, I had to break quite a few eggs. I think you always do when you're doing something like this. Um, and I'm not suggesting not breaking eggs, but I am suggesting that um, applying at least as much effort to go around after yourself and tidy up, you know, go around and try to bring people on who, the trouble is that a lot of the yeses you get are actually no's. Mm. And if you're, if you're in a sort of hierarchical organization, you take the yes as a yes, if you're not careful. Um, and, and you know, I think I could have done more to put the thing on a firmer footing before I left. It's still going. It's still it is growing. It's doing some great things, but I I just think I'd like to have seen it accelerate even faster than it's, than has happened. And I think that's down to me not putting enough effort into this explanation to people who I thought were saying yes, but actually weren't. Well, that uh, you know, you you have hit on what is my what would have been my last question. So I will ask one follow up question to this now, then I'll do probably two more questions, and we'll call it a discussion. So one of my last questions, you know, what advice would you have given yourself a few years ago? It sounds like that that would be the piece of advice. I, yes. I guess the follow up question: What you described? How do you know that a yes is actually a no? Uh, what what is the? You have any any secret for when somebody their lips are moving yes, but you know inside their brain is shaking no, because that's a really important thing for the, the change agents and organizations to figure out. Yes, I mean, I think if I'm a bit more accurate, I did sort of know the yeses were no's, but I didn't pay enough attention to that. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't do enough about it. I didn't do enough work to go back and say, right, come on, let's sit down and work out what it is that you're saying no about um, and see if I can explain it better or, or adjust what we're doing in a way that will make you comfortable. Um, I think it's body language. Um, it's, it's, it's words people use. Um, it's the structure of the organization. You know, you can, I think, usually um, get a fairly good idea from um, an organizational chart um, who is going to feel 
um, threatened by innovation uh, and do the, you know go from there to work out what you know listen very carefully to the words they're using and and watch their body language um it is a skill that comes with, with time and experience i think but but and the first bit of the skill is knowing that it's a truth you know knowing that yeses can often be noes uh, it's a, a good takeaway for people and i think certainly something that many many people who have done similar things to what you've done i think will say they had to learn sometimes the hard way that yeses were actually no's or in some cases were even traps <laughs> yes and not by people who are trying to be malicious but they just don't believe so they put you in a position where it's hard to succeed all right chris we, we've got about five minutes left so i would love to uh, have you share with the group a little bit what you're up to now so you, you returned to civilian life about a year ago and innovation yeah. didn't stop where you did it no, because I got so um, uh, excited and intrigued by it in my time in the military that um, I wanted to continue uh, doing it. So um, I'm doing quite a lot, actually. It's proving to be very exciting. I have a portfolio of roles that are focused on, I guess, innovation strategy and leadership uh, in both the, the public and private sectors. Um, a bit of venture capital, some consulting, advisory roles, non-executive directorships, um, including Oxford University. Um, I'm mentoring for a, a really exciting organization called um, Creative Destruction Labs. Um, I'm delivering innovation education to the armed forces uh, in, a, in something called the Percy Hobart Fellowship. This is an idea that we would take military people and embed them in startups three days a week. And in the other two days of the week, we would give them lectures and mentoring. And we would run this for three months um, and upskill uh, the, 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 the Navy, as it happens, because they're the ones doing the pilot with us um, in, in how to do innovation. And it's, we've run the first course, and uh, I've loved it. Really exciting. Um, and I think it's going to go from strength to strength. I think that it will go uh, out to the other services and, and beyond defense, actually, because it's really relevant in the public sector. And actually, by, by, you know, by embedding people in a startup, by God, you learn quickly, what does it mean to be in a startup? And some of the preconceived notions and some of the ways of thinking that you have from being in a large bureaucracy disappear. And it's, it's really um, uh, exciting. And I'm also about to start a coaching course um, uh, with Myla Campbell um, because I'm fascinated by, by that. So, so the answer is quite a lot going on. Um, uh, and I'm pleased that it's safe. So I, I, there's one, one question I have to ask. I'm not sure if you'll share it with people or not, but when you, you told me about the Oxford, I, I asked, how does, how does one get on the board of, of regents or directors at Oxford? Uh, can you share well, how exactly that happens? Do you know, it is only the second time in my life that I've ever applied for a job. The first time being when I joined the army. Um, the Oxford University advertised uh, on um, a platform uh, that I have subscribed to, which I have looked at many, many times and never seen anything interesting. And there up popped this job description <coughs> for what's called an external member of the Council of Oxford University. The council is what they call the board, because of course, Oxford, having been around for hundreds of years, couldn't dream of calling something as simple as prosaic as the board. An external member, uh, meaning you're not part of the uh, administration of the university or uh, uh, a, a part of it, any faculty. Um, and, and Oxford University has four external members. So I applied and um, very kindly, they gave me the job. So the, 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 the lesson from this is make sure that you actually keep your eyes <laughs> up. And you, you never know what you're going to see on platforms. You never know what, what's going to be advertised, but uh, you know. Absolutely. I wasn't looking for, for, for that particular job. I, you know, I, I did have the feeling that I needed to have a connection with academia because I'm very clear that any kind of innovation ecosystem must have a connection with academia. So I want that. I, in broad terms, I, I wanted that, but I wasn't, didn't even know about this existence of this thing until. Um, I mean, I was a student at Oxford, but I don't remember anything called the council. It was it was obviously far too grand and far far away from me to to be of interest to me. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I applied and I went through an interview process and I got it. It's great. 
So I'm going to ask one last question, which is uh, advice for people who this, uh, I'm going to build up to it. But the, the question will be, what advice do you give people, the people who are reading the book, people who are listening to this, are, are trying to drive innovation in many cases in their organization? Any summary advice you give as you get prepared for that? I just say one mm -hmm. of the things I've heard of this conversation that has reflected in the other conversations we've had is just this basic curiosity which I think is so important, just saying that we're never done learning and, and we need to learn from, if we're in the military, non-military West Coast organizations. If we're in non-military West Coast organizations, maybe we need to learn from the military. And as the saying goes, magic happens at intersections. You bring them together and very powerful things happen. So Chris, what advice would you give to, uh, to listeners here? Well, I would like to pick up that last one because I think it's so important. I mean, so, um, Curiosity, I think, is an absolutely essential characteristic of leadership. And I think it's arguably the most important characteristic of leadership. And it's not just about a lifelong desire to learn, but how you learn, because often you don't um, know what you don't know. So, so I, I do think be curious would be a big part of my recommendation to anybody who's trying to think anything about innovation. Um, the other thing I would say is be persistent, <laughs> you know. Um, it, the, the system, the existing infrastructure, the existing uh, bureaucracy in any kind of organization beyond a startup, and even they quite quickly accrete processes, the system's going to try to get in your way. Uh, and uh, you therefore need to be resilient and robust and, and prepared to, to keep going in, in the face of difficulty. I think if, you, if you're curious and persistent, you'll go a long way in, in innovation. All right. Be curious and be persistent and watch out for the next time Oxford advertises to add somebody. <laughs> Chris, as, as always, it is a pleasure. Thank you to those of you who participated in this and those who are watching the video. Thanks for the great questions. And again, the book is Eat, Sleep, Innovate, eatsleepinnovate.com has all the information about it. You can read more.